God has to say about relationships. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is John Sablon of World of Blaze Incorporated. And I am so, so happy that you all that you all decided to join me this evening. Had a lot of people who had interest in this topic. So um, this is the second webinar that World of Blaze has done. We did one back in December, which probably most of you joined. And we have even more people joining us this evening. So just want to thank you all for taking the time to join me today. Um, we're going to go ahead and begin in prayer. So let's just say a quick prayer as we get into this. And this is real quick. Um, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so God's blueprint for great relationships, right? This is obviously a very topic, a big topic of interest because everybody wants to know how to improve their relationships. And hopefully part of your goal for 2020 was to do just that. Two relationships in particular your relationship with God and also your relationship with those near and dear in your life and probably some of those that aren't so near and dear, but you want to um, work on those relationships too. So um, thank you all for joining <clears throat> me today. It's great to have so many of you here. I can't wait to share this valuable information on healthy relationships, um, giving you the guidance that you need to create loving relationships that are built on God's divine plan. So first of all, I want you all to keep in mind as we journey together, <clears throat> that while we all strive to meet the standards God has set for us, um, none of us are perfect. So myself included, I'm probably the least perfect of everybody that's joining today. Um, we all fall short. So that's why we're here, right? Um, our relationships are far from perfect. We are far from perfect. Um, but we do have a wealth of information that are at our dispose disposal in sacred scripture itself. So um, keep in mind, Jesus was human, right? We just celebrated uh, Christmas, the, the solemnity of the nativity of our Lord. Um, and so he came as one of us. So he was truly God, but truly human. So Jesus understood the daily struggles of relationships, right? He understood the ways in which we, he didn't do this, but he understood the ways that we try to be selfless, but often act selfishly. Um, we try to be honest, but we often hide parts of ourselves and try to act um, with compa compassion, but still hurt one another. So he also understood the importance of relationships. Um, in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, he responds to a question about which is the greatest commandment by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Um, and he said, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So this is important to remember because if you think about it, um, and, and a way to, 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 I guess, picture this, my dear friends, is vertical, right? So we love your God. We got to get vertical first, and then we can love our neighbor, right? So we get horizontal. So it's a cross, right? So we got to get vertical before we can get horizontal, um, and that's what the Lord says. So these, these two commandments are key not only in walking with God, but in being happy, Right. Think about it. So if your relationships aren't working, you can't be truly happy. No matter how successful you are in your career, no matter how much money you have, where you live, you could have the biggest house, but be the loneliest person. Right. Um, so let's explore this topic of relationships, starting with our own relationship with God. Again, getting vertical first and working toward our marriages and our families. Um, and then, of course, our friendships, our dating life. Some of you are single. Some of you are widowed. Um, some of you um, are divorced. And so you're trying to figure out, Lord, what are you doing with my, me and my life? Um, some of you are, are um, but all of you um, and all of these relationships are sacred to God and designed for our happiness and success in life. So I want to start with a question so we can each get to know one another. So those of you that are with us, um, what brought you here today? So maybe you're struggling, maybe your marriage is good, but it could be better. Maybe you're struggling with your boyfriend or your girlfriend on our, in a particular in issue, but in the chat, in the chat box, share with the group, whatever you're comfortable with sharing of why, what brought you here today? Maybe you're just not happy and don't understand why. Maybe you're on the brink of divorce. Um, please, whatever you feel, share, please share whatever you feel is comfortable. You guys aren't talking. Okay. 
okay, maybe nobody's feeling comfortable right now. Why you, why you decided to show up? Um, hopefully, as we continue to do these webinars, we start to build a little bit of a community and you all feel safe and comfortable, right? This is a community of fellow Christians, brothers and sisters that are looking to do the will of God. So um, whatever brought you here, we're just we're glad that that you're here. Um, OK, thank you. I see Rose there. You need help in bettering your relationship with your ex-spouse. OK, he's not baptized and you're a baptized Catholic. Um, all kinds of gorgeous that there's a, there's a, a name to remember. Friends and extended family issues. Definitely. We all have those. Um, Jessica saying wanting a stronger marriage. Yeah, but mostly wanting my husband to have a relationship with God. Amen, Jessica. Keep praying for your husband. Um, I know I was once there, so um, never underestimate, especially the, for the wives out there, um, for the moms out there. Never underestimate the prayers of a mother or a wife. Super powerful. And I'm a testimony to that. So based on some of these, thank you for sharing. Um, I hope you all realize that everyone has their relationship issues. Um, you may think that you're alone because, you know, other couples, other marriages or other families seem perfect. But trust me, all of us struggle in relationships one way or another. Um, you know, I'm very blessed with a, a, a family, my nuclear family. We have a great relationship, but we also have our challenges. So don't ever try to judge people from the outside. Look, you know, looking in, you don't necessarily know what's going on, but we all have our challenges. So um the good thing is, the reason why we're here is because we have a great relationship um, book at our disposal. It's not like in the self-help, you know, um, section of your local bookstore, even though you may find some there too, um, or on the help self-help section of Amazon. Um, it wasn't even written in the last couple of, couple of centuries. Of course, you should know this. It's the Bible, right? Um, I think I've heard somebody say, uh, you know, it's basic instructions before leaving earth, right? B-I-B-L-E. So that's, it's the Bible. So as we know, Jesus viewed relationships, our relationship with God, as well as our relationship with neighbors, friends, and families as very important. So it stands to reason that the Bible would contain information that we, um, about how we should treat one another, right? So you may say, and I know some of you may be thinking this out there, I've read the Bible and it certainly doesn't tell me how to get my husband to pick up his dirty socks. That's true. Um, but if you read it with an open heart, it does tell you how you are to behave when you find fault with one another. Um, yeah, I'm seeing you guys, you guys are still sharing. Thank you for, for sharing. Cause a lot of you are really, you have a great desire to improve these relationships. Um, so how about this? If your brother sins against you, go to him, go and show him his fault, but do it privately just between yourselves. If he listens to you, have won your brother back. We hear that in Matthew 18. And le then later in that verse, Jesus says, truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In Colossians 3 verses 12 through 13, we, which we'll explore more in uh, detail later, it tells us how we are to relate to relate to one another. So therefore, as God's chosen people and holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Ugh. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. We think about this and when we pray to our Father, right? Oh my goodness, it's so difficult when I when I pray, right? Forgive Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Um, that That's difficult, right? Because um, if, if the Lord's going to forgive me the way I forgive, I am in trouble, dear brothers and sisters. So we all have to work on that. So there is countless other relationship advice in the Bible. And if you don't think it applies to you, try praying about it, right? Asking a fellow, uh, a fellow brother or sister to help you find the answer. While the Bible does not tell us specifically what to do in every situation, it does provide answers to those who seek them, right? So the Bible is, this is the sacred word of God that applies to us in our everyday life if we're open to what God is speaking to us on how we should respond, how we should seek him in all ways and all things. So right now, take a moment. So if you have something to write with, uh, if you're, if you're, you know, maybe you're taking notes on your phone, um, take a moment to jot down for yourself one or two questions you may have about a relationship, about your relationship, either with your spouse, your partner, family, friends, family members or friends, um, you know, your boyfriend or girlfriend. Uh, it can be a dilemma about how to react to something or a question about how to solve a conflict. conflict. So keep this handy for you later. So let's take a few seconds write down, you know, one or two questions. 
you know, some of you already said, how do I get my, my husband to have a, a, a better relationship with God? Um, you know, uh, Tony said she's here, she's starting a new relationship. Maybe, you know, what does that look like practically? You know, Toby's talking about better understanding his role as a husband. Um, so some of these, maybe putting that in the form of a question that you have about your relationship with your, with your spouse. Yeah, Susie, good one there to help with marriage and the in-laws. Two, two challenging things, I'm sure. So what kind of questions would that unfold for you? So <clears throat> let's go back to what Jesus said about the greatest commandments. Love the Lord God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And so the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. We know that. We heard that in Matthew 22. Um, if this is true, my dear friends, then before we build the dream marriage or family, we have to tackle the first commandment, right? As I was telling you, loving God, getting vertical before we can get horizontal. So for true Christians, true Catholics, we believe that all love is of and from God, okay? Um, according to John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. So <clears throat> a question for ourselves is, are you on the vine or are you like that dried up vine? You have to ponder that. Are you connected to God or separated from him? You need the love of God in your life in order to have love with others. So you know, a lot of times, especially when I travel and do different engagements, um, and I do speak about these two commandments, whenever I ask folks of how they love God, oftentimes I hear people explain to me how they love their neighbor. And while that is an act of loving God by loving your neighbor, that doesn't necessarily speak to how you love God. So how do you connect with God, right? So let's, let's all think about that. Is it prayer? Is it sacraments? Is it the faith community? Um, but if you're not taking time to build a relationship with God, how can you therefore love your neighbor the way that God calls us to? So the first thing we need to do is we start by making a commitment to pray every day. Are you praying every day? And I'm, and I'm not talking about while you're driving or while you're doing the dishes, um, but, it, but a, set, a set aside time. And I'm, not to say you can't pray while you're doing the dishes. I do that all day long. And I pray while I drive and I pray throughout the day. Um, while I'm walking, while I'm at my desk, but, but do you set aside time only for prayer and in a place that's sacred? So maybe you have a sacred space set up in your home. We all should as faithful Catholics. Um, uh, maybe you're blessed like I am and we have the perpetual Eucharistic adoration chapel and, and if you're by it, you know, you can stop by and set a set aside time prayer there. Um, but it has to be a time that's set aside um, then consider the sacrament. So if you're, if you're Catholic, perhaps you need to go to, to confession, reconciliation, right? To reunite with God. How often are you practicing that sacrament? Um, that way you can also participate in the Eucharist, right? So the, the source and summit of our faith as Catholics is the Eucharist. And so what more intimate way to grow in your relationship with God than to receive him body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist, but you need to do that while being in the state of, of grace. And so that's done through the sacrament of reconciliation, um, and perhaps maybe some of the you out there aren't necessarily Catholic or not are are maybe um, falling away Catholics, and you're 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 kind of jumping on to see what we have to say about it. So if you're not, um, you know, maybe you're attending mass. Maybe you want to go to praise and worship service to just try to reignite your relationship with God, and to consider, you know, maybe you want to you have a good Catholic friend out there that has piqued your interest in the faith. So you know, start to have those discussions, and with that, that should be considering your faith community. So develop relationships with other Christians, other Catholics, of course, who will pray with you and for you, right? Get involved in your church. Volunteering is a great way to do this. Um, your faith community can help you connect to God. So um, things that we can work on ourselves, obviously our prayer life, um, start simple friends, and and then also um, start to, uh, you know, work on the sacraments in your faith community. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned earlier, the Bible is our source for relationship advice. It's where we should go when we're like, you know, we're pondering how to resolve conflict, um, considering how to treat one another, deciding what we need to do in certain situations in discernment. Maybe you're discerning a specific relationship. Maybe you're even discerning something like, you know, 
this job seems to be toxic, right? Because a lot of the people that are there, the situation that it places you under. So um, we need to, you know, always go to the word of God, sacred scripture um, and the church to be able to understand what does God desire for us to do and, and understand in these situations. So in Colossians chapter three, as we talked about just a little bit ago, it gives us the basics, you know, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. We talked about forgiveness, right? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So this verse in Colossians chapter three, verses 12 through 13, this verse starts by reminding us that we are God's chosen people. That means that if we are Christians, it's because God first chose us. Think about the power in that statement. We, all of us, are God's chosen people. Right? I, I think about in, in Gospel of John where Jesus says, especially during difficult times where he's, you know, the troubled times where he says that um, if, the, if the world hates you, remember it hated me first. If the world persecutes you, remember it persecuted me first. If you were of the world, the, lo- the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world and I chose you out of the world is what Jesus said, right? So this is what this speaks to is that we are God's chosen people. So if that is true, in accord with our own chosen status, we have to conduct ourselves in a certain way. And Colossians provides that ample example or that answer. So it's important to remember that these guidelines are meant for all relationships, friends. That means our spouses, our significant others, our neighbors, our teachers, our friends, our family members, even when we're interacting with those who do not believe as we do or don't act accordingly. So when there's people that aren't living a Christian life and are actually counter church, counter Christ, um, we still have to conduct ourselves in this way because just because somebody else doesn't live the faith doesn't mean that we're not called to. And they're chosen too, um, but but they're also making a free will choice. And so we have to model for them what holiness looks like, what healthy relationships look like. So again, I get it, right? These guidelines aren't easy, but it does help us remember that God loves us despite our own flaws. Remember those? We all have those, right? Um, yes, we all have them. So some of you may not think so, but we all got a like long list of um, issues. I know I do. So because we live in the love of God, and we talk about being the, the vine of the branch, a branch of the vine, we are not dependent on, on another's return love in order to survive. So what does that mean? Because we're, we're chosen and loved by God first, it's not your love for me, albeit I, I, I will say that I would appreciate your love for me as a fellow brother in Christ, but that my own survival, is, it's not dictated by your love. It's dictated by God's love, Right. And so to think about that, that so many times as people, um, we, we put so much stock in, in relationships, um, in what other people think about us. Think about how many, especially our younger generation today, how they're always fighting, right? The follows, the likes, the subscriptions um, to, to define themselves, to find value and purpose and self-worth. Um, so take a, take a moment to look at the characteristics listed in Colossians 3. Um, and, and maybe you can choose at least one characteristic you feel you want to model in your relationship. So I'll go back to those, right? So we think about compassion. Um, maybe that's something you want to work on. Kindness, humility. Oh my goodness, right? The capital sins, pride, boom. I struggle with it. I'm sure well, you guys all struggle with it too. Humility is that characteristic I need to, to demonstrate, um, to battle pride. Gentleness and patience, right? If you're a prideful person, you're an impatient person. Trust me, I'm, I'm, I'm living that. And so I have to exercise humility. I have to exercise patience. So it's, it, we have to make sure that we, we pick one of these. So let's go through those. Let's start with compassion. <clears throat> so what does it mean to be compassionate? Think about it in its Latin term. It means to actually suffer with, right? Compatio, I believe, is the word. Um, so this characteristic you know, involves not just head like the how, but in our heart, as well as the why, right? We act in a certain way because we are moved to do so. We're compassionate. We're moved towards somebody. We're, we're suffering with, um, and we put ourselves to the side, friends, and then and we put that person above us, right? So as husbands, as wives, um, as parents, we're always constantly putting those that we are in our, our nuclear family ahead of us. And we do that even with our fellow brothers in Christ. But we, for those of us who are in family life, um, that that's putting others before you. And, and Jesus calls us to be selfless, not selfish. So consider the times when Jesus, the model, right, was moved to compassion. 
So in Luke 7, he feels compassion for the widow of Nain who lost her son. Other times he felt compassion when, remember, the multitude of people were following him, right? And we just heard this in, in, um, in the mass readings. That in Matthew, Jesus withdrew from the crowds for some much needed alone time. So even Jesus needed to be him by himself and recharge, right? But when he saw the crowd there, the Bible tells us he had compassion on them and healed their sick. And then later in that, he, he, as the crowds grew hungry, he performed the miracle of the fish and the loaves, and he fed them all, again, because he had compassion for them. So think about a time when you felt compassion for somebody. Maybe that was today. You know, maybe you were, you were just running an errand, and you saw someone who needed your help, um, you know, or you really wanted to watch your favorite television show, but postponed it because your friend needed to talk. Maybe you were on your way for some quiet time, and um, somebody, you know, a friend called you, or somebody, you saw them. And you were rushing, you know, you needed to get to another appointment. Um, and, you know, maybe you're headed to a pedicure or something. And some, you saw a friend you haven't seen in a while. And they seemed distraught and distressed. And out of compassion, you felt like, look, I got to open them up myself. You know, the Lord put you in my path right now. Um, so compassion is, is that opportunity for us to put ourselves to the side and put that other person first, right? So let's talk about kindness now. Kindness is the next trait. You know, to be kind is to be free from all that is bitter. If you think about that, right? Rough, anything that's rough or harsh. Um, even when somebody does us wrong, doesn't act like we would like them to. Hello, welcome to family life, right? Is when we treat each other, um, we take each other for granted. We do that a lot, friends. But in Luke 6, 35, um, this describes the rewards for Christians who will receive doing good to others. It says, then your reward will be great. Scripture tells us, and you will be sons of the Most High because he is kind to ungrateful and evil people, right? So the Lord, in his infinite greatness and love, um, shines upon all people, right? Loves upon all. And it's just our responsibility to accept and receive that love. And um, Peter, uh, in First Peter chapter 2, um, this alludes to the Lord's kindness by saying, so get rid of all evil and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander and yearn like newborn infants for pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up to salvation if you have experienced the Lord's kindness. So because the Lord himself has been kind to us, we are to act with kindness towards one another. A great test of whether you should say or, or do something should be, is it kind? Right. So think about that. Right. If I just pause for a second, is it is it is it an act of kindness? Should you repeat should you repeat something bad about your neighbor? Is that kind? Is that is that a, an act of compassion or kindness? Probably not. So this is the litmus test that can save you from a lot of sin against other people. Right. It's just trying to pause for a second. Ask yourself the simple question of is this an act of kindness? And trust me, we know the world is in a difficult place today. And we need more acts of kindness. We need more love being demonstrated in a very Christian way. So let's talk about um, humility. Whoa, this is a virtue that I have to strive for every single day, friends. Um, humility in the Bible, in the biblical sense, does not mean like you think poorly of yourself. So I've, I've heard it said before, it's not thinking less about yourself. It's about, it's about thinking about yourself less. So not less about yourself. This is not a self-esteem issue. This is just, you know what? I'm, I'm going to have an indifference to myself and to my desires. Um, but it doesn't, doesn't you know, have a sense of false humility where I, I think I'm pond scum, right? It doesn't mean that. So um, it's a lowliness of mine rather than, you know, being arrogant and proud. So when you're humble, you do three things, okay? Some, some tips here. First, you rely on Jesus, Christ himself, and you don't count on yourself, right? So I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a knucklehead. If you can hear this, you're going to hear it's it's... It's rock solid because I'm a, I'm a knucklehead. Um, so I'm going to rely on Christ rather than myself. And I'm going to think of, of St. Paul, who in 2 Corinthians speaks about a thorn or an imperfection he asked the Lord to take away. Remember, three times I, I asked for the Lord to, to, to take this away from me, he says. And, he, and what does Jesus say? What does the Lord say? My grace is sufficient enough for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So paradoxically speaking, when we allow ourselves to be weak and reliant on God— we receive God's grace and power, right? So a lot of times you'll hear people say, God never gives you something you can't handle. And in all, in all actuality, he does give you a lot we can't handle on our own human level. But when we lean on him, as our Lord tells us, all things are possible with God. And so in a very real way, we, we encounter a lot of things that we can't handle, but with God we can. 
So that's the first thing is we don't rely on ourselves. Second, a humble person has a balanced view of himself, his or herself, right? So that, what does that mean? That means knowing the importance of my God-given gifts, but also understanding that he is just one part of God's creation and not indispensable. So sure, you may have gifts, I may have gifts, but that's just one aspect of, of what God has given me in his world and his creation, right? So do, do not um, get ahead of yourself. No one is indispensable. Nobody, we're, you know, we're not holier than thou. We're not speaking from a pedestal above people. Because um, even as scripture tells us in Romans, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but th- to think with sober discernment as God has distributed to each of you a measure of faith. St. Paul tells us in his letter to the Romans. So third, a humble person puts others before himself. So that's really easy, right? We're just, it's acts of um, selfishness that, that are the counter to this. So humility, we don't want to just look out for our own best interest, right? True love, as St. Thomas Aquinas tells us, is willing the good of the other as other. So simply willing the good of somebody else specifically because you love them. Um, so Think about that when it comes to humility. We have the ultimate example of humility, obviously, in our Lord Jesus Christ. He who humbled himself upon that cross, right? Putting us before himself. Man, that's something to ponder, right? As we, uh, as we count the days before we get into the Lent, Lenten season. So <clears throat> let's talk about gentleness and patience, dear friends. Um, so when we think about gentleness, really the, the, the right word in this sense would be meekness. So when you think about meekness, what do you think that actually means, right? Some people think that's um, compliant, kind of mild-mannered. Um, some people may be thinking of it as submissive, um, which, you know, some of those obviously work, but we are to submit ourselves to the Lord's will, um, but meaning we're submissive to God. But when it comes to confronting sin, oh, yeah, we got to be strong, right? When it means conf- confronting evil in the world, we got to be strong. So don't get gentleness and meekness confused with like you know being a doormat right that's not the sense of meekness it means submitting yourselves humbly to god's will but then at the same time standing up for that which is true and 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 beautiful and good which is god so when we talk about acting with gentleness this is to guide others to do the right thing without submitting to acting with anger right so i have a problem with this y'all i'm gonna be honest with you right so you most of you that do know me know i'm pretty passionate pretty intense right so a lot of times I can come across um, overbearing or maybe like I lack gentleness because of my f- my fire uh, that I have and then just my personality, my temperament. So I have to be careful of that. I have to, I have to temper that because um, we have to be, as St. Paul tells us in Galatians, right, to be a spirit of gentleness. So um, St. Paul tells us, pay close attention to yourself so that you are not tempted to, right, to be um somebody who's overly passionate. So right now, think of the ways in which you, cor- you correct your spouse or another person in your relationship with them, right? Um, think about, right, maybe you're, um, you're a person that wags their finger or pokes people's chest. Do any of you do that, right? Could you perhaps act more gentle? Um, think about with your children, right? A lot of times as parents, we can get irritated, annoyed, because this is the fifth time I told you to clean your room, and you haven't done it yet, so I feel like I've got to to um, get angry or to yell. I'm not saying you can't discipline your kids, right? You guys need to figure that out. But I'm saying, can we, um, rather than be tempted to anger, we can still be firm and still be gentle, right? Um, we, we have that. So patience is a virtue. We know that, just like uh, gentleness and, and, and meekness are as well. So it's it's one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, right, when we think about patience. So um Think about that. So draw your inspiration from God, friends. Um, he's patient with our <laughs> shortcomings, is he not? And um, we should we should try to work on extending that same patience, right? We're so quick to ask for forgiveness, or maybe we're not, but we're so quick to expect forgiveness from God or want forgiveness from God. And how all, how do we all struggle with giving forgiveness, right? Giving forgiveness. Okay. Forbearance and forgiveness. Wow. So let's talk about forbearance. Maybe that's a a foreign word to you, but to forbear means to refrain from or hold back. Um, So we're, we're to recognize the variety in God's creation. We put up with faults and idiosyncrasies and um, we exert self-control in our interaction with others. Right. So our, and our example of of forbearance is God, right. Who demonstrated forbearance. He withhold withheld even his wrath, if you will, um, um, in the sins of man. 
um, and sent Christ himself to, to sacrifice for our sins. Um, so we, he didn't punish us um, because of his forbearance. So that's a, kind of an explanation there. So since God demonstrates forbearance in, in dealing um, with our sins, we're, we're called to do the same thing in dealing with our earthly brothers and sisters. Anybody else have a problem with that? That's me. Um, got an issue, you know, um, with forgiveness for sure. Something that we probably all struggle with. Um, cause forgiveness isn't, isn't an easy, it's an easy concept to grasp. I guess we can all understand it, but it's a difficult one to put into, to practice, right? It's, and, but it's, yet it's one of the most important characteristics we must cultivate, right? In fact, Matthew five tells us that before we come to offer a gift at the altar, before we come to communion, we got to reconcile with our brother. Ugh. <laughs> So therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and then and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. We hear from scripture, right? First go and be reconciled to them, them and then and come offer your gift, right? That's important stuff, friends, important. Yet so many of us live, right, in a state of unforgiveness and even revenge. Like some of us have that, that vengefulness in us. We're tempted towards vengeance and vengeance is, the, is that of God. It's the Lord's, right? So... Know that forgiveness really blesses us twice. I, you know, I have this saying that when we harbor anger or hate or, or we don't forgive, it's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die, right? So um, when we forgive, it's, it's blessings twice. Why? Because it's, it's one blessing upon yourself because you're freed from that, and it's a blessing upon the person, right? So um, the person that you, you exhibit mercy to and demonstrate mercy to, it obviously helps them builds up their spirit, but it also builds up yours. So not an easy thing to deal with. We need to continue to pray and work towards it. So, wow, let's let's keep going. You guys hanging in there? I hope so. Um, trying to make sure I'm respectful of your time. So um, I, uh, I am watching the chat box. So if you have anything, don't, don't hesitate to ask away. Okay. Um, so clothed in divine characteristics, you know, what does that mean? You know, how, so let me ask you this. How, how are you doing with that? Are you wearing the new clothes that, uh, as a, as a child of God that reflect God and in, in your interactions with others? So do people know you're Christian without you telling them by your very, uh, modeling, right? By your, by your interactions, by your example of humility, of patience, of compassion. Now remember, okay, I'm again, remind you that none of us is perfect except God. But we should be striving towards exhibiting those, those characteristics, friends, right? And when we talk about the word strive, strive actually defined as a vigorous, rigorous struggle towards the opposition. So strive, when I go, I'm striving for perfection, doesn't mean like I'm, it's passive or it's disengaged. Strive actually means a vigorous struggle against opposition. And so I'm counter towards that vice. And so even though we're imperfect, we need to strive towards perfection. So think back to one or two of the characteristics that you identified. Remember that um, that you exhibit well. So can you, um, you know, one of it, whether you was hum, uh, humility or patience, is there one of those? Um, are there one of those that you can give an example and share with the group? So uh, maybe maybe there's a characteristic out there. Maybe some of you are really good about compassion, being compassionate, but maybe not so good about being humble, which I don't know how that's going to work. But can you share with the group whatever you feel comfortable sharing? Perhaps you can describe, maybe you had, like for me, um, humility is a difficult thing. You know, um, got, had a very difficult childhood, rough upbringing, faced a lot of violence. So pride and anger and violence ruled my life, much of my upbringing. So Humility was difficult for me and continues to be difficult for me, but I had to overcome that by obviously the grace of God, by continuously being intentional every single day of how I can be humble, right? Um, I just shared a video online, if you just saw it, that I did for Paradise's Day, That Men Is You, and we talked about a battle plan. So every day, friends, we should be, we should be trying to target a vice we want to root out and a virtue we want to work on. So can you maybe you can share some of your examples in the chat so the folks can um, benefit from that? OK, um, so now let's call to mind one of the two areas that we need to work on and consider one practice you can put into place this week. Right. So let's this is flesh to the bones, people. We're not just going to join the webinar, and not do anything right. You want you just listening. We want you to be acting. Right. So 
um, what's one thing you can do to promote that characteristic? So if it's forgiveness, maybe you can make a plan to contact a friend you haven't forgiven. Man, that's tough, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I just saw a, a chat that Rose says it's difficult to say. I'm sorry, it is. But, but maybe you're going to call up a person that you've never said sorry to. Maybe that relationship has been quote unquote healed or you've moved on, but you never really apologize and ask for forgiveness. Um, uh, maybe the characteristic is humility and you want to consider changing the way you interact, um, maybe with your employees or the people you work with. Um, and you want to take a more humble stance, right? So like me, I have a, um, pretty stressful job and a, a high level job. So, uh, easily, I'm easily tempted to be prideful and to lack compassion and patience and just bark out orders. Right. So, um, maybe I need to practice reticence, not speaking, right. Um, and always giving my opinion. Um, Wow, Maria says, you know, seeing her dad cry really let her her guard down and uh, helped her stop um, judging her family. You know, I'm an emotional guy, so um, I can cry uh, for a lot of reasons. There's a lot of emotions inside this knucklehead here. Um, I can see how that can help. Um, Arlene's asking a question here before um, we kind of move on about, do you need to reconnect to forgive? Um so that's a, I'll give a twofold answer, Arlene. Um, you don't, you can forgive that forgiveness, right? Is comes in within your heart and that's between you and God in particular. But does that person know that you forgave them? Right. And if you think about it, it's just like us going to a priest um, to seek the absolution, right? Hearing the priest say, I absolve you of all, all of your sins. So even though we can go to God and we get a lot of these arguments, especially from our separated brothers and sisters out who aren't Catholic, why do I got to go to a priest to confess my sins? Can you go to God? Absolutely. You should go to God, right? Because God knows your heart. But when we go to the priest who's in the person of Jesus Christ, we say in persona Christe Capitas, in the person of Christ the head, we receive the human communication as him in the person of Christ who absolves of us our sins. When we said sorry to God in a very formal way, we receive absolution and forgiveness of our sins. So, so Arlene, my dear sister, I would say, yeah, it's actually probably a big part of reconnecting because think about the blessing, as I just talked about, that when you actually forgive somebody and they hear that, when you can hear the relief that they've like, you know what, you, you've forgiven me. And they can hear that in, their, in your voice rather than you just saying, you know, I'm giving this to God. And I think you can do both. You know, as Catholics, we're, we're both in. So hopefully that helps you, dear sister. Um, all right, let's talk about neighborly love. Um, Jesus tells us to love your neighbor as yourself. This is us getting horizontal, remember? So we got vertical. We're talking about getting right with God. Um, <clears throat> and now we're talking about loving our neighbor. So who is my neighbor, right? Like the, the man in the similar passage in Luke um, who asked that and, and was answered with the story of the Good Samaritan. You all remember the, good, the story of the Good Samaritan, right? So that this story illustrates the goodness of one Samaritan man who is one of the three, who sh- who's only one of the three, right? Who show mercy to the man who was beaten by the robbers. So the, the others just go on their way. They're passing the other side of the street. They're pretending not to see the man. And so what are we supposed to conclude from this, right? Our neighbor is anyone we come into contact with, honestly. Um, it, it's really anybody that is puts in our path, right? By God, or at least allowed to be in our path. So think about that for a minute. We're called to love everybody can y'all say that with me everybody so that includes catholics christians non-christians those who persecute us family members who who yell at us or talk bad about us um those who are unkind to our children um those who steal from us right those who've done done have betrayed us or have done something wrong to us um those who belong to a different social circle than we do maybe those who are poor or less fortunate the addicted, right? Um, in our area uh, where I'm at, there's a lot of a lot of homeless, right? A lot of folks that are uh, unfortunately have mental health issues and and are are enslaved to the addiction of drugs. So I'm called to love them as sons and daughters, right? Um, there's other people like at work, right? Who uh, maybe it's your boss, maybe it's your coworker. So in, in you, you guys get enough of the examples, right? But it's not easy. But again, we have the example of Christ, who we're supposed to be modeling ourselves after, right? If we call ourselves disciples, followers of Jesus, we need to model ourselves as Jesus says, you know, deny yourself, pick up your cross daily and follow me. So Jesus said, pray for those who persecute you. 
Jesus himself prayed for those who persecute him. He forgave sinners. We need to forgive those who sin against us, right? Um, we, we need to take note and take heed to Jesus' own example. So think about, for a moment, a neighbor, a quote-unquote neighbor, right? Whatever context that may be. So not just a physical neighbor, but anybody that you encounter that you may have not treated with compassion or kindness or humility or gentleness or patience or for forgiveness or forbearance. Think of one, so think, bring that person to mind and then think of one thing that you could do to treat that person better and challenge yourself to put that into practice. So and you know, Chrissy's talking about bosses. Maybe you have an issue with your boss. You know, can you, can you demonstrate more humility to that person? Right? Can you kill them with kindness? And I don't mean that, like, kill them, kill them, right? But um, just, you know, be a light. Can you do that? So maybe share an idea. What can you do with whatever neighbor you're struggling with to demonstrate a, that characteristic that you want to work on? <clears throat> all right now we're getting to the good stuff not to say relationships you know friends co-workers neighbors aren't good stuff but this is what a lot of people are interested in right romantic love okay the bible doesn't say anything at all about dating right and that's because it wasn't necessarily a custom at that time um although i think yeah christy's responding to um you know the greeting sincerely greeting uh, folks every day. Yeah, maybe just a small hello, a kind little smile, right? Smile goes a long way. So let's talk about romantic relationships. Um, you know, marriages were arranged back in, in the time of, you know, ancient church when our, when our Lord walked the earth. And so while you might uh, know your betrothed, right, you didn't go out together before marriage as a couple. Um, so even though we don't hear anything about dating specifically, the Bible does tell us about sexuality, about morality, about integrity, um, about relationships in general. All right, I'm going to put pause. I see some of the, the questions coming through now. So um, Susie has a question. Can, can I love yet choose to stay away or have no relationships with? Yes. So great question, Susie. Um, this is something that I deal with personally, okay? And so when, um, so I'm going to stop here on the romantic side and just address that because Susie has a great question. When, um, when we have unhealthy relationships that can be detrimental or toxic to your own spiritual life, to your own mental health, to your own emotional health, um, there is no reason to subject yourself to those relationships, okay? I want to qualify that. It, it, to the best of your ability, when we say have no relationship, if this is family members or whatnot, maybe there's a simple, maybe you're always, you know, um, on their birthday, you're going to reach out to them and always, you know, send them a, a nice text or, or send them a nice note, send them a card. Maybe during Christmas is when you say, you know, hey, I've been thinking about you guys. Hope everything is well. And you just send a nice Merry Christmas. Hope you have a blessed New Year. Right. So there's ways that you can find boundaries and parameters um, to protect you and your family. Right. I had to learn this myself personally because I was letting the relationship dictate um, what I expose me and my family to. So meaning the relationship, like if that's my family member, right? And so we have to be careful and cognizant of, um, of w what healthy relationships look like. So I want to just give that shout out to Susie and let her know, yeah, you can love, you should be loving um, regardless of the type of relationship that you have, right? So put parameters in place, you guys. That's again where meekness um, tends to get confused with false humility. So Meaning, oh, I'm called to love all my neighbors, all my family, so I'm just going to be a doormat. Nope, that's not what Jesus means, okay? Um, that's not what we're called to do. We're not called to be doormats. We're called to love, and um, part of loving means to, to put in structures that allow you to love freely. And um, even when people aren't necessarily there. So, you know, you have to, each of you have to discern that yourself, and you have more issues, you know, talk to your prayers priest or talk to somebody who can, who can help you with that. So let's go back to... Uh, romantic love 
The Bible doesn't talk to us about dating, but it does talk to us about these other things. Like I said, sexuality, morality, integrity, relationships in general, right? So um, in 1 Corinthians, matter of fact, we hear that we are all to glorify God in all that we do, right? Think about that. That, that should apply to everything. So we're all to glorify God in all that we do. So that therefore includes every part of your life, which includes dating. Okay, so here's some guidelines I want to offer to you. Go back to the basics. Read Colossians, Colossians 3 and try to act out those characteristics. Humility, patience, forbearance, forgiveness, those things we talked about, compassion. If you can't decide whether to do something, measure the action against those guidelines, right? Then make, then make that would make a great yardstick, right? So uh, when you think about those things, does this help me in whatever situation? Does it help me act in humility, in, in gentleness, and so on and so forth? Okay, so that's the first thing is go back to the basics, use the Bible as a measuring stick, and apply it to that decision. The second thing I would say is invest in yourself. So the best way to find and build a healthy relationship is to work on becoming the best person that you can be. Okay. And sometimes you hear it, you know, Matthew Kelly coined it, be the best version of yourself. And I would even take that higher, right? The best version of myself, the best John I can be still falls short of the glory of God. I want to be Christ-like. Okay. I want you to be Christ-like. And so being Christ-like means I'm going to have to practice a lot of self-mortification, self-denial, and I have to put others before I put myself there. Okay. So uh, what is it? It's, is it the acronym joy, Jesus, others, you, right? So if I can live to that, to put Jesus first and then others and then myself, I'll learn to tame my pride and tame my selfishness, okay? So, um, you know, consider Ephesians 4, which tells us to put off our old selves and becoming new, right? Striving to be like God. That's why I said I want you to be like Jesus, not just the best version of yourself because sometimes that version still isn't enough, Um And so remember that the right person for you will also be looking for someone of great character. So work on the character, right? If you want, um, it's funny, I told this to my two boys, especially I said, if instead of you worried about finding a good woman, worry about being a great man. Okay. So worry about being what it is that you would be looking for anyway, right? Assuming that you got that right in your head. So instead of you worried about finding the right person, worry about being the right person. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. Right. So that's that's tip number two. Three is create boundaries when we talk about romantic love. Okay, so remember that dating is not an end, but a means to commitment. Okay. So the ultimate goal for those of us that are in romantic love, dating, dating with discernment. So if the person is not good enough to marry, they're not good enough to date. I'm gonna repeat that. It bothers a lot of people, but I say it anyway. If the person is not good enough to marry, they're not good enough to date. Why do I say that? This is especially for the women out there. Quit trying to find special projects, okay? Nobody, none of us can change the heart of man. So when we think that, oh, I can change him, oh, I can change her, you're fooling yourself. You won't change anybody that doesn't want to be changed. And so if you think that somehow your love for them and their love for you, emotional love, is going to somehow all of a sudden you know, thrust them into God, you got it all twisted. That's not the way the human life works, not the way the human mind works. So um, I, I would say create those boundaries. Remember that dating is is discernment to marriage. If they're not good enough to marry, they're really not good enough to date. And you need to be pretty clear about what your values are going into that relationship. So um, we'll see. Let me give you an example in Second Timothy. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So we're, we're also told to avoid sins of the body. So if, when I say create boundaries, that means if you don't know what your values, what your boundaries are going into a dating relationship, then you're, you're not going to figure that out as you go into it. So if you're all of a sudden going to be in a heated moment with a person, and then you're going to decide to have that conversation about really, we're not going to go to second base or whatever it is, language you're going to be using, right? Um, we're not going to be engaging in that type of behavior that's going to be difficult to put yourself in that scenario and could put yourself in a bad situation to where you could be tempted to sin. So if you say from the beginning, you create those boundaries that like, look, I'm a woman of God. I'm a man of God. You know, we're not going to be hanging out at each other's houses or in a place where we would be by ourselves and tempted towards lust. Um, we're not going to lead our, ourselves to sin. You got to say that up front. You know, I want to protect my um, virginity. I want to protect my um, purity. Right. And um, really, I'm not looking for any of that. And you got to say that up front. And so especially for the women out there. OK, keep in mind, men and women view 
sexuality differently. And um, even with the good holy men, they're going to be, they're going to see it in a different way. So um, we can do a whole nother episode on that one, but I want you to remember to create boundaries. Okay. So what do I mean by that? And in, in, if I was to shorten this up and simplify it, it means avoid having sex before marriage. Okay. That's what it means, especially for the young adults out there. Keep your body pure so that you can enjoy sexual unity within the confines of marriage to understand the procreative and unitive aspect of what it means to be married in the marital act. Okay. So hopefully that was clear to you, my dear friends. So let's talk about marriage with Christ. Marriage with Christ. So for those of you who are in the married vocation or discerning the married vocation, let's talk about that. Marriage is first and foremost a sacrament. A sacrament's not a symbol, but it's an external sign of an eternal reality. God's grace in our lives working through the sacrament of matrimony. Okay, so we're told in Ephesians that human marriage reflects a divine marriage between us and God. If you go to Ephesians 5, right? So Let's take a look at that. <clears throat> um, oh, sorry, I'm laughing. I'm seeing Rose. Um, Rose uh, putting a little comment there. A man broke up with her right before Christmas because she kept saying no. Well, good for you, Rose. That's not a good man anyway. Drop the losers out there, women, and especially the men, right? Let's step up. Let's step up, men. Sorry. So let's go to Ephesians 5, 21. I'm sorry, Ephesians 5, 25 through 32. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. To make her holy, holy, I'm, I'm emphasizing holy, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So Ephesians 5 is one of the most powerful scripture passages, and I would say 21 through 32. Um, that gives us the prescription of what it means. It starts off by saying, be subordinate to one another out of reverence for Christ in 21. And then it says, wives be subordinate to their husbands as to the Lord. Women tend to lose their minds because they're like, what do you mean subordinate? I don't like this. It's, it's not equal, blah, 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 blah. And men go, I like that verse, right? It, it tells me that my wife has to listen to me. Um, but no, what it's saying is be subordinate to one another out of uh, reverence for Christ. And then it says, Specifically, wives be subordinate to your husband as to the Lord. But look at what Ephesians 5.25 says, dear friends. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And how did he love his bride, the church? He handed himself over for her. Okay? So, th this is key in the marital relationship. That while women are called to subject themselves or uh, sub be subordinate, which in the Greek word, um, or I'm sorry, it's, I think it's a Hebrew word, hupotasso, it, may, it means placing yourself under the subject or mission of a general, right? St. Paul speaking in military language back then. So if your husband's mission is to die for you, what wife is not going to submit herself to a Christ-like husband? Okay, so for the men out there, be Jesus Christ. Lay down your life for your wife and your children, and then your wives will follow no problem. Amen, sisters out there? I mean, come on. That's the part we need to get through our heads. Is it not that honestly the man has the more difficult role and responsibility he's priest prophet king of his home he's the priest and bishop of his home he's the spiritual leader in his home and if he is dying to himself every single day for his wife and his children his wife and his children will follow statistics will show you that studies will show you that i'll tell you the living proof of my home when i was being a spiritual sloth and an idiot nobody was following me okay when I came to Christ and to the Lord and I started bending the knee before the Lord God and I became a man of virtue and valor and, and holiness, not to say I'm, I'm perfect, I'm on a mission just like y'all, but then my wife can feel safe. Then my kids can feel safe, okay? So, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Ephesians 5 is an amazing prescription for what marriage just looks like. So, when we enter... um. Oh, praise God. I see Toby's in there. His wife for getting early process of having your marriage blessed in the church. Hey, praise be to God. Get your marriage convalidated, Toby. Um, my wife and I were married outside of the church because she was a, she was not a, a convert and I was a lazy Catholic. I wasn't even practicing the faith. So let's get God to um, to bless our marriages and then it become truly sacramental. God's life working in that. OK, so when we enter into marriage, dear brothers and sisters, we are ref reflecting the profound mystery of Christ and the church. That's what we're representing. We're that sign of God's own love, the bridegroom with his bride, the church. So that means for us as Christian people, this is how we're witnessing to the sacrifice he made on behalf of his beloved. 
Okay, so that's a huge responsibility. When we all wear and bear the sacrament of matrimony, that's a cross. And that cross speaks to an unselfish, unconditional decision love that gives itself away every single day. Okay, you with me? So that's why none of us, none of us should um, enter into marriage lightly. Okay, we're out, to, we're out to view it as something sacred. Consider for a moment the sacredness of marriage, your marriage, if you're already married. And describe some of the ways in which you behave like it's a sacred union. Okay, I know Toby asked for me to say something again. Um, but keep in mind, all the listeners out there, this is being recorded, so you'll have access to this. So go to World of Blaze and definitely subscribe. Once we record it, it's being recorded now. It'll, it'll be available to you to watch. Watch it with your wife. Watch it with your husband. Watch it with your kids. You know, let's get more people on this, okay? So talk, like, for those of you who are married, if you're already married, so describe some of the ways in which you behave that make it a sacred union. So I'll, get, I'll start off, okay? My wife and I pray together. We start the day in prayer together. We end the night in prayer together. And we pray for each other throughout the day. Um, we ask, we do an examine. Um, oh, you're welcome, Chrissy. We do an, what we call a nightly examine. So in that examine, my wife and I, we both, we talk about what are we thankful for in a day? So that's the first thing we say. How do we see God working in our life? And um, how do they, we each feel our love for each other today and what we can do better? So sometimes that's more prayer. Sometimes we say, hey, I need you to help me out with the dishes a little bit more, whatever it may be. It's a safe place for us to talk. So we behave in that way because we believe that our, our marriage is sacred. Um, it's a sacred union. Um, and then other people see us, you know, uh, how do we treat each other in public, right? This is another way to treat it as a sacred union. Are you bashing your husband or your wife in front of other people, making fun of them? Are you tearing them down or are you building them up? Right. When when you can cut down your spouse in front of people, I don't care if it's family, friends, coworkers, it that that is not showing that it's a sacred union. Right. We are one flesh, one flesh union. That means when one of us is being attacked, the other is being attacked. When we're doing the attacking, we're crumbling from within, dear friends. OK, so when what are the ways we can, can behave as a sacred union? We never, ever speak negative about our, our wife or our husband. We never cut them down. That's for talk inside, even to your kids, you know, pinning your kids against it to where they can play against mommy and daddy. Oh, that your dad. Again, I'm not talking about something in jest, but keep in mind, like Proverbs 18, 21 says, the power of life and death reside in the tongue. You can speak life or death into your family, into your husband, into your wife. So keep that in mind. How do people know it's a sacred marriage, a sacred union? Do you treat each other with reverence, right? Like I'm a, I'm a speaker and it's funny because people call me up. I just got several calls this week about doing this conference and that conference and this retreat and that retreat. And the first thing I say is, you know what? Give me your information. I need, I never make a decision without uh, talking it over with my wife, right? And so that's a way to treat it sacred. Oh, that's good. And I'm like, you know, and my wife, I'll ask my wife and I'll say, hey, sweetie, I got a call for this. And she's like, well, are you, are you needing my permission? I said, baby, I always need your permission. Right. Even if I know her answer is yes, I still owe that to her because she is my beloved. Right. So even though I know her answer is going to be yes, I don't just assume. Right. Even though she may not do the same and give me the same courteous, which she always does for the most part. Um, I don't say, well, you didn't do it last time, so I'm not going to do it this time. No, 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 no. I treat it as a sacred union. The person on the other end of that phone, other end of that conversation realizes it. And so does my wife, which is the most important. Right is the most important. So, um, okay, moving on. Marriage as a sacred union. Let's talk about some of the ways in which marriage is a sacred entity, a sacred union. First of all, we realize it's a covenant that binds us together as one, right? So keep in mind the covenant versus the contract. In the world of the contracts, it's an exchange of goods and services, right? You have a contract with AT&T, with Comcast, with Verizon. You can break that and you all can walk away. You can go trade in and get another deal with somebody else, right? And that's how people approach marriage today in our society, in our secular society, right? They try to trade up, trade out, trade in when it comes to their spouse. And they treat marriage less like a covenant, an exchange of persons, you know? It, they treat it less like an exchange of persons rather than and they treat it like an exchange of goods and services. See you, see you Toby. Thank you for, us, for joining us for, when you, for what you could. And don't forget to, to sign back on. So that being said, my dear friends, um, when you remember how Adam responded to Eve 
when he saw Eve, when uh, he awoke from his deep sleep after God created Eve out of his side. He says this in Genesis 2. This now, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman, right? For she was taken out of man. But that response, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This is, there was no superlatives in the ancient Hebrew language, meaning there's no good, great, greatest. So when you use something twice, it meant it was the highest of the highest, right? So bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Adam is saying, Eve, you're the best part of me, right? The best part of me. So I think, uh, shout out to bro Ryan out there, Ryan, I, he, I know you discern the same way I do, brother. So um, absolutely. Um, but think about that. And uh, we look at our, our wives or we look at our husbands. Are we looking at it through the eyes of Adam, the unfallen Adam, that this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh? Is, that the, is she or he the best part of us? Right. And I think that's what we need to reclaim. We need to reclaim that identity as true children of God. And we need to be able to do that. So we need to witness that in our sacred entity, in our sacred union as husband and wife. So it's also sacred that these two people share their sexuality only with one another. So it's exclusive, right? That they undertake that covenant in the presence of the community and of God and making Christ at the center of that marriage, right? Christ-centered, Christ-centered. So while marriage is a legally binding contract, it's also a sacred covenant. It's, you know, uh, uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, right, talks about three to get married. He has a great book, so I recommend that to you if you do, if you do look for it. Three to get married, it's, it's husband, wife, and it's Christ. And if for those marriages that are not Christ-centered, the ones that do survive aren't doing really well. It's a cross. Marriage is a cross. But a cross with Christ in the center is, is, is purifying, right, is, is salvific. So keep that in mind, right? Um, so how should we act, y'all, when it comes to marriage? Let's visit, visit some scripture verses. Ephesians 5.21, I told you already about that. Great Bible scripture, right? Submit each other out of reverence to the Lord. Um, and, and, and I would say, go to that, meditate on that. So if your marriage creates a united person, one flesh union, we got to remember that whatever we do hurts the other, okay? Sorry, as you can tell, I'm a little bit passionate about that one, right? For a long time, I didn't get married. Just an idiot here, y'all. So um, praise be to God, I get it now. All right, now let's move on to the next one. For those of us who have children, <clears throat> and this is obviously speaking in the context of a parent-child relationship, but we're all spiritual parents to some degree. So becoming a parent, God willing, right, this flows from the sacred union of marriage. That means what we share, an invisible love becomes visible in a, in a child if God wills it. So I just recently became a grandparent. Thanks be to Jesus. Baby Isabel Nicole was born December 13th. She just, you know, you know, reached a month old. And my daughter, Bria, and her husband, Jamie, their invisible love came together to create life in baby Isabel. Whew. And my three children are example of that, right? So this flows from, and it's the first thing that we're talking to, you know, my, my son-in-law and my daughter, Bria. It's like, yeah, now they get, we can tell them, we can give them all the advice we want about how, you know, uh, marriage and family really changes your life to where it's not about you anymore, but they're dealing with it right now, flesh to the bone, materialized, rubber meets the road kind of way, right? So the ultimate goal of their life is, um, is to raise this child and uh, whatever children that God gives them. So that means that everything a parent does should work toward building up the child's character and improving his or her life, right? We're the primary educators of our children. So it sort of sounds like children then, can sound like more of a burden than a reward, right? It can be difficult for some of these young parents and some of the parents out there. But as we hear in Psalms, children are heritage from the Lord, offspring, a reward from him. So Psalm tells us again, Psalm 13, 1, 13, 9, 113, 9, he settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children, praise the Lord. So children are a gift from God, even when they don't act like a gift from God right? Their life is precious in the eyes of God. And so we've been entrusted. We're stewards of that gift, not the masters. We're stewards and we have to give that gift back. So if you really think about it in that context, children are pure joy. They're a gift. They're the closest thing to God, okay? Because they we've just made love manifested in a person. We think about the Holy Trinity, how that the love between father and son spirated, right? It bore forth the Holy Spirit. That's a small sliver of an understanding of what God is like when we have a child, right? So, um, so if you think about it, they're pure joy. So throughout all of scriptures, we know Jesus praises children. 
right? In, in Matthew, he, he calls a child to him as an example, saying, truly, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like the little child, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus tells us in Matthew 18. So, so brothers and sisters in Christ, we're called to cherish children, not only to just accept them as gifts from God, which they are, but to protect and love them all of their lives, right? That's our responsibility. So we're always parents the minute that God blesses us, we remain a parent. So understanding that the children are not always perfect angels, because you know they're not. We know that it isn't easy. We know we're imperfect, they're imperfect, but that's what we're called to do. And we have a perfect model in God himself, okay? So this parent-child uh, model reflects how we're to treat our children. So I want to, a, a key point here, especially for the families out there, for those of you who um, have these questions is you got to witness. I, we have a podcast that I do with my sons now. So if you're not aware, you guys need to find out world of blaze. There's three podcasts and working on a few more, but I do my true faith, real talk. And now I have a, a podcast with my two sons called priest, prophet, and King. Okay. And the, the whole point of that is I have two adult sons, 23 years old and 19 who actually own and live out their faith. My daughter does too. Don't get me. She's the oldest. Okay. But the point of that is that we've got a witness to our children a faith-filled life. And um, we want to help parents. We want to help improve these relationships. And so parents out there, it's not good enough to just tell the kids what to do. you got to tell them why they're doing it, and you got to model it. Even as imperfect as we are, you need to model the behavior. So you can't tell them that God is important when they don't see God being important in their lives. And that's really important. And they can't. you can't... Remember, as parents, specifically fathers, but definitely parents, we're an example of God's mercy or lack of mercy. We're an example of God's um, uh, compassion or lack of compassion. So keep that in mind, okay, dear friends? Um, raising children the right way. We got to know that, you know, we're, we know that we're, we're to love, discipline, and cherish our children in, in one way, in one sense, but putting it into practice is, is another, right? So I'm going to give you four tips to become a better, you know, Christian parent. First thing is to pray with your child and bring him or her up in the Catholic faith. There's nothing, there's no greater gift outside of life than you can give that child than to bring him up knowing God, especially in today's world, okay? Um, so you need to teach them the faith, not just the what, but the why. Critical, critical, critical. Go to church, go to mass, pray at home, set up a sacred altar, Make sure they receive all the formation. It's not the responsibility of father or your DRE or the catechist to teach them the faith. They supplement what they should be getting at home, peeps. Okay? Raise your kid up in the faith, and, and it, it can be done in a variety of ways. Okay? So pray with them. Teach them about God. Teach them about prayer. Teach them about the saints. Teach them about silence, how to silence themselves before God. How can you listen to God when silence is the primary way of which he speaks to us? So that's the first thing is prayer. Second, be unified with your spouse and leadership. This is probably the most challenging part in the home, specifically when uh, it's unequally yoked. And I'm probably speaking more to the women than it is for the men, because the men are typically the ones that are way behind. So for the men, wake up. Because statistics show, there's a Swedish study that was done, that if the woman's a spiritual leader in the home and the husband is not, it's only 2% likely that your kids will have any faith at all. Okay, If the husband is a spiritual leader in the home and the wife isn't, it now increases to 65% and above that your children don't have any faith at all. So the men, it's absolutely critical that you step up and own it. Women, get your husband on board. Keep praying for them. You keep fasting for those guys. Show them this video. Make them watch it, okay? But you need to be, um, you need to be united in your leadership. That means you make all your decisions together. You don't sit there and disagree in front of the kids. You go and have that discussion inside the room and say, you know what? I'm going to talk to mom about this. We'll be right back. Because you may have a different opinion than your, your spouse may. And you decide on what's the best thing, what's the common ground that makes the best sense. Even if, right, you guys are on different sides of the fence, you need to come to a common decision that the kids see both of you make. Okay? So maybe um, an example would be you want a certain curfew right? You want one that it allows more time and your, your spouse wants an earlier one, right? Or vice versa. Um, that's not, a, you know, you, you got to find a middle ground. So maybe the dad out there is saying, I'm okay, or mom's actually saying, I'm okay with midnight and, and dad's saying, I need it at 10. Well, maybe that common ground is, all right, 1030. Maybe it's 11. We're going to meet in the middle. Okay. Or 11 every other week or something, whatever it is that you're doing. It's not easy. And it's going to be unique to every scenario, every home. 
but do your best. The point is you need to let your spouse come to common terms with you. And sometimes you may take the lead on an issue and sometimes they'll do so. And you can kind of rotate that out. But you have to have a common ground or the kids will exploit that to the nth degree. Okay, so third, build a relationship with your child, a real relationship. That means don't just be present physically, be present emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. That Because that relationship is going to change as the child grows. And it involves you spending time together and doing activities and being aware of what's going on in their life and being engaged. And even when they're fighting being with you, right, you need to be able to work on that relationship. So, you know, as a three-year-old, you may be coloring together. As a teenager, you may be doing a monthly dinner, taking them out on a date. I would say take them out on dates. My wife came up with this idea. My wife's a genius. Love her to death. Um, but it's just like date your kids. Right. So she, she would have uh, mother son dates and mother daughter dates. And I would have father son dates and father for father daughter. And I learned that late in life and I wasn't perfect at it. But for all of those young parents out there, you need to date your kids. OK, the same way you need to date your wife or you date your spouse. So work on that relationship because, you know, you got to be close to your kids. But if you don't spend time cultivating that, what is it going to be a surprise when they decide to move half across the country without you? Is it going to be a surprise where they've got nothing to say to you when you're by themselves? Um, I agree. Maria is commenting on this. It's difficult when only one parent wants to work. And, and, and you know what? My wife was there. So I, all I would advise and counsel is for the moms out there, for the wives out there, pray and fast for your husband. Pray to, um, St. Jude. He's, he's, he's the, you know, patron saint of lost cases, hopelessness. Pray to St. Monica, pray to St. Elizabeth. Um, there's a lot of saints out there that can intercede on your behalf. So keep working, dear sister. Um, I'm a living testimony to the prayers of a wife and a mother, okay? Um, so build your relationship with your child. Um, put in the work and the effort, or else it's going gonna, it's gonna to show um, to bite you uh, in the end if you really want to have a relationship with your children. Fourth, raise your child to think and act depend- independently. What do I mean by that? Not to challenge you necessarily. I think challenging is okay. That's part of the developmental pro- process process but teach them to think to seek truth specifically is what i mean right to seek truth um in a very humble uh honest way sincere way so you can provide that by having discussions so let's say you have discussions about the faith and they're having a, a difficult time understanding it work through that with them okay work through that with them but teach them those uh, that ability to reason brothers teach and sisters um, t- teach them the ability to reason. Okay. This goes specifically, not just questioning things that are objectively speaking goes for morality even more so. So if you teach the, the, the children, the values of our Catholic faith, you give them examples of the important decisions and why they matter. And in the context, they should be able to make decisions for themselves when you're not around. Okay. Or you give them that, that lifeline. So provide a safe place. They can come and ask questions. There should be no topic that's off limits. Okay. When you're raising your kids, right? No topic. As difficult it is, as it is, I've worked on the relationship with all my kids and we can talk about anything, you know, and I hope they would bring anything to me, even though it's embarrassing. And have I been perfect at it? Nope. Um, and I'll continue to work on it. But I want them to be able to tell me anything because I want them to be uh, I want them to go to heaven. OK, and so if I want them to go to heaven, I need them to come to me when they when they've done some things that are pretty hellish. OK. All right. Long lives. Relationships equal long lives. Um, so true. I think the Harvard Grant study, which was like a 75 year old study, talked about, you know, uh, it followed um, men uh, early on. I think their freshman and sophomore year at Harvard all the way into their like 90s. And when it came down to the key finding, it was about love and relationships. Okay, so good relationships equal long lives. So um, while we know that our home was with God, we call that the beatific vision as Catholics. Um we kind of like our life on earth, right? Like we, uh, we, I mean, I wouldn't mind if Jesus came tomorrow. I just want one more shot at confession. Um, but you know, I, uh, but we kind of like living on this earth, right? We, especially in here in America, cause we're very blessed and fortunate. Um, so we love our lives as we should because they're a gift from God. But I just want to talk about this gem of wisdom. So people with strong social ties live longer, right? There's a study done in um, 2005, uh, the Australian long, Longitudinal Study of Aging, and it found that people with the most friends tend to outlive their counterparts by 
And I'm not talking like Facebook friends or Twitter friends or anything like that, right? Um, another example, would, uh, another study had more than 300,000 people followed for seven and a half years. They found that people with strong social ties had a 50% chance of survival, regardless of their age, sex, health status, and other factors. So the, the risk of having no friends at all is, is actually very much a life and death situation. Matter of fact, we see that in our world today where people are, you know, the, the, the top four killers or two of the top killers of, of, of our children is suicide, right? So people are having mental health issues, depress, depression, um, you know, they could be in a room full of people, but the loneliest person in the room. So it, it's, you know, key that we were meant for community. We're meant for um, relationships, specifically with God, but obviously with others. So keep that in mind, dear friends, that good relationships are key to a, last, uh, a long lasting life. Um, so cultivating relationships, we want to live longer. You guys hanging in there? I know we're, we're just about uh, wrapping up here. Um, we just want to develop those relationships, okay? So find friends in the right places, dear friends. You can't go to the bar or to the club and think you're going to find good friends. We want to make sure that we're finding friends at a local church, at places where virtue is being cultivated, where you have a common ground, common values, okay? Okay. Um, Restoring, we talked about forbearance and forgiveness. I think uh, this is going to take a, an, an inordinate amount of humility in order to be able to seek those out. Okay, so whatever relationships are in your life, um, even if they're broken, um, you know, seek those to repair those because you don't want that on your heart. So humble yourself, ask for forgiveness, right? And then ex demonstrate that forgiveness as well. Okay, Um all right. So do you want to enjoy the fruits of great relationships with your partner, you know, your, your significant other, your family and friends? Well, of course you do. So start with God, getting vertical first. Remember, we talked about that and then getting horizontal. Consider, um, you know, reading the Bible, spending more time in, in the word of God and and continue to work in improving your relationships. See your marriage as, as a sacred union. See your kids and your friends and your family as gifts from God. Um, so lastly, when we talk about, um, you know, the, the one or two things, you questions you had at the beginning of the class that if you wrote it down, just take a moment to, to look back on those. And um, if, if there's anything, reflect back on that and what we learned today to be able to use that to help with your relationship, okay? Um, so some of the, the areas I wanted to point to you, resources for, for uh, good relationship is John Gottman. So G-O-T-T-M-A-N.com. Great, great resource for family life um, relationships. He, he's, he's such a, a huge, he's a Catholic psychologist and uh, everyone uses him. So John Gottman, G-O-T-T-M-A-N, as well as um, uh, FocusOnTheFamily.com. FocusOnTheFamily.com are good things for, for resources for you all. And um, I just want to thank you. Uh, we need your, you know, thank you guys for joining me. We're right at that. Um, I'm a little bit, a couple minutes past 645. And just want to thank you for, um, you know, for joining us on this. And I want your feedback, you know. I think a big part of what we want to do at World of Blaze is to bring you resources that are helpful to you, that are going to help you grow in your relationship with God and your relationship with your brother and sister in Christ. Um, keep in mind, um, just as a reminder, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, share the link out. If you sign up, we'll be do, trying to do a webinar a month. And so if you have any ideas, you know, comment even now. Comment on what you want to hear about. Um, I, um, I want to be able to, to bring that to you. Our, our postulate world of Blaze wants to be able to bring that to you, to be a trusted resource, to give you faith-filled advice that's centered on Christ and that's going to help you in your life as a person that's striving for holiness, okay? So, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, you will get the link as a follow-up, but if not, go to the YouTube channel. It'll be under the World of Blaze webinars. Uh, this is recorded, so you'll get all the audio, all the video again. And, um, you know, what we want you to do is to share it. Share with everybody you know. doesn't matter. The nice thing about webinars is you can be in Chicago, like Rose, who's out in Chicago. Thank you for joining us, Rose. Um, or if you're on the East Coast, wherever you're at, um, we want you to subscribe. And do check out our other podcasts we got more projects coming, um, and we want to hear from you, okay? So, my dear friends, uh, may God continue to bless you and keep you. Um, for those of you that want to go ahead and uh, once I end this, it'll be posted up on the, on the website or on the YouTube channel so you can rewatch it, okay? 
God bless you. And uh, we will talk to you all later.